thanks for the great introduction and what a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank um, all the organizers uh, and of course Matt for the invitation. What a pleasure to talk to you uh, on Industry University Day, the Innovation Chain. That's the title of my talk. Well, uh, I'd like to talk about two topics that everybody knows about, climate change and COVID-19, and in particular, the materials that go into them, how we might solve them, and some of the similarities between them. So my outline is here on the uh, lower right. Little, these are both international challenges. They're beyond the scope of one country to fix. They both require new technology. We don't have the commercial technology to solve either one. Uh, they require fast action because things are happening now. There is unequal impact on underserved communities. They're bearing the brunt, I think, of both, uh, both of these issues, these challenges. Funding opportunities are growing and the university uh, industry cooperation can be really powerful. So those are some of the things I would like to cover. Uh, first of all, very quickly, in four charts, let me try to uh, talk about climate change. You see over here on the upper left, uh, all the human CO2 emissions going back from 1850 till now and where they came from. This is the challenge that we face. You see over here on the right, uh, the temperature anomaly of the world since about 1850. And you see nothing happened for a long time. And of course that emissions were low during that period. And then uh, we started to see an uptick here around, uh, around 1980. And uh, it's been pretty steady. There's a time delay between that and the emissions uptick was somewhere around 1950. And if you extrapolate this line, it's simply a linear extrapolation, no fancy modeling here. You see that by about 2063, we will hit the two degree limit, which is a limit we would like to avoid. Here at the bottom are the wet on the right, you see the weather and climate events from 1980 till 2020. Uh, the cost and the number, the bar is the number, the cost is some of the graphics here, some of the lines. Uh, you see what a tremendous increase. In 1980, there were three events. In 2020, it was a banner year, there were 22. Uh, and uh, they occurred all over the United States. And this over here on the left uh, shows what they were and where they were, wildfires in the West, of course, hurricanes in the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast, tornadoes, severe weather, uh, drought in the West, really remarkable, 262 deaths at least were uh, attributed to this in 2020. And it's still going on in 2021. The Texas freeze in February, uh, the Pacific Northwest heat wave in July, Western wildfires right now. Uh, so this is very, very uh, present now. So it's a, it's, it's, it, the problem is affecting us now. Interestingly, there's a correlation you can draw here between this very clear rise in the global temperature and the rise in the weather events. And so that correlation I think is really telling. You need action on three fronts, have to be carbonized by 2035 for the grid and the economy by 2050, that's gonna be a challenge. We need to project future climate at local scales so we can know where the impact will be and get ready for it. And we need to deploy climate resiliency and adaptation for infrastructure, energy infrastructure, transportation in infrastructure, but uh, very importantly, and for communities. So we've got to do all three, all three of these things at once. Here's a little bit about the decarbonization challenge, and this is where energy storage comes in. This is a report that came out by, from IEA in May of this year. It shows one scenario for decarbonizing the entire world. This is not just for the US or Europe, it's the whole world. Starting in 2020, you see where the emissions are at the present time, where they're coming from, the relative contribution from each, and how it, we might get it down by 2050. It looks pretty easy when you put it in a graph like this. Uh, if you start looking at some of the markers along that graph, you see how tough it is. For example, by 2030, uh, we have to add as much solar and wind, well, four times the amount of solar and wind that we added in 2020. And of course, 2020 was a record-breaking year. 
And we have to do that every year from 2030 to 2050. That's going to be quite a challenge. By 2035, we have to have all personal electric car sales be electric, 100% electric, and heavy truck sales 50% electric. So we have some of that technology, but it'll be a challenge to roll it out. And you can see some other markers here. So it's really a question, can we do it? And in the same report, IEA said, well, we have some of the commercial technology, namely we can electrify buildings, we can electrify personal cars, we can clean up the grid with lots of wind and solar. We know how to do that. It's uh, even possibly uh, inexpensive enough. The challenge is to roll it out in time. But there are other challenges where we don't have the commercial ch technology. We have to innovate that. And they gave these examples, heavy duty industry like C uh, steel and cement production, heavy duty transportation, that means long haul trucking, that means uh, rail, it means marine shipping, it means aviation, don't have the commercial technology yet to uh, decarbonize that. And also agriculture and land use, we're really not there. They picked out three things in particular, advanced batteries, green hydrogen, and direct air capture, where we have to make some very fast inroads. We have to innovate quickly. So uh, this is the decarbonization challenge. And a lot of that challenge will be met by energy storage. So a little history about energy storage. Uh, Sony brought out the lithium ion battery in 1991. They had a camcorder they wanted to make personal, uh, but the battery was too heavy. So they made a strictly business decision. Let's bring out the lithium ion battery. Of course, that spawned over the next 20 years or more, a huge uh, amount of personal electronics. So laptops, everything you see here, iPads, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, and those all use lithium ion batteries. That's about 2% of uh, US energy. Then came 2010, the Nissan Leaf, the beginning of electric vehicles, 2012, the Tesla Model S. And by 2024, Consumer Reports says, we're gonna have a hundred new battery electric vehicle models to choose from. Very clearly, this has momentum, it's going to happen. And it will use the lithium ion battery. Remarkable that the same battery would work for personal electronics that works for electric vehicles. It's gotta be about 10,000 times bigger just because to drive a, a car takes a lot more energy than to power electronics. That's about 28% of US energy transportation, uh, US energy. And about half of that is personal cars. Then in 2018, we saw the first big installations of electricity on the grid. That was uh, Hornsdale, South Australia. It was 129 megawatt hours. 2021, this year, just three years later, uh, the biggest installation is 1,600 megawatt hours. That's at Moss Landing in California. Lithium ion batteries, and once again, remarkable that the same battery can do this job as well. For the grid, you typically want a thousand to 10,000 times bigger battery than you want for an electric vehicle. What's well, remarkable. And this, uh, the grid itself accounts for almost 40% of US uh, energy. So the history of the lithium ion battery, here's another graph that shows how there's two curves here. The red curve is the energy density, which has gone up dramatically, maybe a factor of three, since uh, it was introduced in 1991. And the cost, which has come down even more dramatically since 1991 by a huge factor, uh, and still going down. And the interesting thing is that the cost of lithium ion batteries has gone down consistently faster than the pro projections were. So this is very fortunate, it makes uh, the lithium ion battery actually cost effective for both electric vehicles and the grid. But we need to go beyond lithium ion. There are a lot of uh, things that lithium ion can't do. Here are some of the beyond lithium ion battery chemistries and technologies that are being developed now. Uh, so multivalent working ions put in magnesium, calcium, or zinc, twice the charge of lithium means twice the energy stored or released. Solid state electrolytes to make the battery safer. 
high concentration liquid electrolytes, which are much less expensive and may be able to work at three volts, different uh, cathodes, so sulfur or oxygen to get a higher energy density, and very important redox flow batteries, as you see in this picture, uh, which are great for the grid because they can store huge amounts of energy. May also need chemical storage that could be hydrogen, could be ammonia, or another petrochemical that you make uh, from green hydrogen. Uh, that will be very important as well. So there are five gaps in the energy storage landscape. Uh, and let's see what they are. The first one is for lithium ion batteries. It has an expensive uh, uh, earth limited and international supply chain. We need to change that. It's gotta be inexpensive, gotta be earth abundant and gotta be domestic. So that requires a new kind of battery. We need many day discharge storage to stabilize the grid against up to 10 consecutive cloudy or calm days. That's what you'll find in the historical record. Lithium ion can discharge for four to six hours uh, at full power, but that's the, end of its, uh, that's the end of its discharge time. So it actually will never be able to supply that many day discharge. We need a much higher energy density uh, battery for long haul trucks, for rail, for marine shipping, for aviation. Lithium ion would be uh, effective for personal cars. That's sort of the smallest unit of transportation. But for freight and for long haul, you, that the lithium ion battery just takes up too much space and weighs too much. So you need a much higher energy density battery, maybe two to three times the energy density of, of lithium ion. And we need local storage for things like data centers, some commercial buildings, hospitals, uh, fire departments. These are must run applications now served by diesel generators. Got to get rid of the diesel and find some carbon free way to do that could be electricity storage. So that's four of the gaps. What's the fifth gap? The fifth gap is a predictive understanding of battery phenomena at atomic and molecular levels to enable us to purpose design a battery for the application. So until now, we've had one go-to battery, that's lithium ion, and we've said when an application comes up, we say, well, how can we use lithium ion? Uh, so as I've just explained, those days are going away. We're going to have to find new batteries, next generation batteries made from different materials and based on different chemistries that uh, go after these. Uh, so we need to be able to design them from the bottom up. Let's start with the atoms. So the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, uh, that's the organization that I direct, uh, pursues these outcomes. This is what we're after. And just a little introduction to J. Caesar, as we call it. It has a national presence. Uh, it has 19 partner institutions. So that includes six national labs, 12 universities, one private company has about 180, maybe 200 researchers, including postdocs, students, and, and senior folks. And it covers the country. We have MIT on the East Coast. We have Berkeley and Stanford on the West Coast. We have lots of stuff uh, in the Midwest, so around Chicago, including the University of Chicago and Argonne National Lab. Uh, and we're able, we're big enough to address the entire energy storage ecosystem. Here's one thing that we've accomplished among many others, and that is an innovation for many day storage, many day discharge storage for the grid. And we started this in 2015. So we recognized the need for multi-day storage uh, and we realized that it had to be very cheap. So we started looking for the least expensive materials to build that battery from. We chose to look at water for the electrolyte, oxygen from the atmosphere, sulfur, of which there is plenty. It happens to be a byproduct of refining petroleum, and we have so much stockpiled, we'll never run out. So this is a simple domestic supply chain, and this addresses the first gap that I was talking about on the last couple of slides. So at the time, we said this will provide electricity storage at the cost of pump pumped hydro but without any geographic limits. You don't need any elevation change. So we published that work in 2017 and spun out a company. It's called Form Energy now. 
It's gone through one iteration. Uh, it went after RPE funding and lots of other venture capital. In fact, it was hugely successful. Uh, it's now collected more than 360 million in venture capital. They made a demonstration, uh, scaled up the lab scale version that we had of the battery. And in uh, May of last year, they signed a contract with Great River Energy, that's Minnesota's second largest utility, to deliver a, a battery in 2023 that can uh, discharge continuously at full power for four days. And that is by far a record. Uh, other technologies and startups are looking at 10 or 20 or 30 hour discharge. This is four days. So uh, Farm Energy is, is clearly the leader, at least at the moment. We'll see how that works in 2023 when it gets installed, but it could be a big step forward to decarbonizing the grid. Uh, if you'd like to know more about Jay Caesar, there's one overview paper. It came out in PNAS last year. Here's the reference, and I, I would recommend that to you if, you if you'd like to know a bit more. Uh, it talks about everything that's happened since 2010 in the storage uh, landscape and how Jay Caesar has, re has responded to it. So let's switch now and talk a little bit about COVID and vaccine innovation. Very interesting chart here from Nature, published this year. How long did it take to develop the vaccines for the various diseases? Some of this goes back to 1880, typhoid fever, meningitis. And this is the timeline that it took to develop the vaccines. Really, really long. The shortest, in fact, until now, has been mumps, which started uh, two vaccines, the latest one, 1960 or so, was developed in four years. That was the world record. Uh, Ebola, which we just completed, but started before 1980, 20 years. This is SARS-CoV-2, uh, the COVID-19 virus, done in less than one year. And this is quite a remarkable uh, accomplishment. Let's look a little bit at how it was done. You might think that science was done at a breakneck speed, and that's what did it. And of course, science and innovation played a big role, but it turns out there are many other factors that, that led to that very rapid development. The first one was 50 years of work on coronaviruses, so that includes SARS and MERS, uh, and of course, COVID-19 is caused by a, by a coronavirus. It was already known that the spike proteins are what invade human cells and that they were, would be an effective vaccine antigen. So this knowledge was already there. There was another 50 years of work on lipid nanoparticles, sometimes called fat bubbles, uh, in which you can put drugs. And these lipid nanoparticles are safe and effective for delivering drugs uh, to, to, uh, to humans. So that was already known, that work had been done. Then there was about 10 years of work on this new platform. So genetic information, DNA or messenger RNA uh, as a vaccine. And the idea here is that you inject either DNA, DNA or RNA uh, into human cells and uh, they contain the genetic information for, let's say, the spike protein, and the human cells create the, the spike protein. Of course, it's disengaged completely from the virus itself, so it's harmless, but it triggers the antibody reaction. So although vaccines had not been developed, HIV was one of the ones that, uh, that drove this, uh, this technology was around. Uh, the timeline, well, in December of 2019, cluster cases of pneumonia were discovered in China. Very quickly, by January 11th, China had solved the genetic code for SARS-CoV-2 and published it, shared it publicly. And this started uh, two or three months, actually, it's still going on, uh, of what some people call plug and play. So what part of this uh, virus can be an effective antigen and how to deliver it. Lots of candidates, you could take the deactivated virus so it couldn't infect, but it could still provoke uh, uh, antibodies. You could take just the spike protein subunits, inject those and get the antibody response, 
or you could use the new DNA or messenger RNA uh, platforms and you could inject them in some kind of a viral vector, which was sort of the universal way of injecting before the uh, fat bubble or lipid nan nanoparticles came along, or you can inject in, uh, in the lipid nanoparticle. Well, very fast, March 26th, uh, the first volunteer injections were done. It was messenger RNA for the spike protein in a lipid nanoparticle, that was the platform. Uh, since then, other platforms have been developed. Uh, and it was not just that science, but um, testing. So, whoops, we're back here. Uh, and that testing and manufacture was enabled by massive funding by governments and by philanthropy. So in the US, 10 billion for Operation Warp Speed. In the European Union, 8 billion. Total of about 52 billion was devoted to this. And that massive funding really, really accelerated the testing. In fact, it allowed companies to do the preclinical uh, vaccine preparation, the phase one, the phase two, and the phase three trials, and manufacturing in parallel, instead of doing it sequentially. And this saved enormous time. Uh, in addition, a very important factor, COVID-19 is so prevalent and so infectious, you need a lot of infections to show that in fact, the vaccines work against them. So this also shortened the time of the test. Uh, this interesting chart came out, I don't know, a couple of months ago, uh, showing traditional vaccine development up here. And you see years, add those up, it's 10 years or more. And what happened with COVID-19 then? And years became months for each one of these steps. That's why we were able to develop the vaccine and get it out uh, in less than a year. So talking about industry university cooperation, probably the most famous case is Oxford AstraZeneca. Oxford actually developed the spike protein DNA delivered in a viral vector. That was their platform. And that viral vector was based on a weakened version of the common cold virus. Here it is for the experts in the audience. Uh, and AstraZeneca, the big company, their job was to further develop the vaccine, although I think Oxford takes credit for developing the first version. But then, very importantly, large-scale manufacture and distribution. Oxford spun out a startup. It's called Vaxitech. Uh, and Vaxitech and Oxford own the rights to the vaccine, the platform technology. They've agreed no royalties until the pandemic uh, is over and subsequent royalties after the pandemic will be reinvested in a new vaccine research center jointly between Oxford and AstraZeneca. So a very interesting uh, rollout and restrictions on profits for this very serious public health uh, challenge. As of August 4 of this, of, I'm sorry, this should be 2021, uh, there were a billion doses, uh, at least in process, 20 manufacturing sites and approval in 170 countries. So that is, is, is really, I would say, remarkable. Here's the global vaccine development. Uh, and you can see nearly every continent is, is contributing. There are now 135 laboratories at companies, universities, and institutions that are working on the COVID vaccines. And here's a chart of how fast they've rolled out. Seems to be peaking now, ever since maybe about May, but obviously a huge challenge for which many, many people are rising to the occasion. So I'd like to switch now and talk a little bit about something going on in the US. That's the National Virtual Biotechnology Laboratory. It's a consortium of 17 DOE national labs initiated in March of 2020, funded by $44 million from the CARES Act. So this obviously came up very quickly after the challenge was recognized. It's a team of 17 people, one from each lab, led by Steven Streifer from Argonne and Michelle Buchanan from Oak Ridge. They have 71 publications in growing as of now. Three of those are highly cited. One is a so-called hot paper by ISI's designation. Four review articles already. Here are the topics of those review articles. Care, point of care diagnostics, respiratory masks, 
health-related environmental microbiology and forecasting epidemics, all very important. So this, and uh, they're collaborating with 42 universities and 57 foreign institutions. So this is really a kind of all of government effort and uh, really uh, been quite effective in the short time that it's, that it's been in existence. Takes advantage of uh, things at the National Lab, computing, very important for COVID, for drug discovery, also for predicting how the epidemic may, uh, may pan out. Lots of chemical, biological, and analytical sciences across the complex. And of course, light and neutron sources that can do a lot with structural biology and, uh, and, dis and drug discovery. So here's some of the things that they're working on. Uh, I'll give a couple of examples. They, uh, the consortium and VBL uh, made an approved ventilator in 12 weeks. That is very fast. Day three, they had a design. Day eight, they had component testing. Day 25, they had a fully functional testing machine for approval. And today it's a production level device. It's out there uh, with these partners. So it's, it's actually in use. And that's uh, addressing one of the great potential shortages of the, uh, epidem of the pandem epidem uh, pandemic. So also production of 8 million automated uh, test kits per week. These were badly needed in the first few months of, uh, of the pandemic. Some details about that. Um, 3D printing played a big role, both in designing how to manufacture and in uh, making swabs. So you could make 250,000 of those a day. Uh, had to validate the sterilization procedures uh, and, and had to make, of course, all the tooling. And it's up now to 8 million uh, tubes a day. With, that's with Thermo Fisher Scientific. Uh, Personal protective equipment, another shortage uh, early in the game. Additive manufacturing for face shields and reusable respirators. Electrospun meltdown filter media for N95 masks uh, and a collaboration on uh, how, to, how to manufacture them that was uh, transitioned to Cummins. Uh, and here's a reusable N95 mask, so with the filter material in it. Another very important contribution. They looked at the viral fate and transport of the virus, and we now know that it's mostly transported through the air by breathing, not so much by touch, although of course it can be. And here's an example of a school bus. They modeled the airflow, stationary bus, doors closed, heater on. These are high, uh, you know, high flow rates so the virus can spread. Here's the same thing with doors open, let it move, heaters on. What a difference. And this tells you right away how to take precautions uh, against the uh, air spreading of the virus. And they also looked at uh, rooms, classrooms, meeting rooms, where's the airflow. These things are uh, very important to know about. Importantly, there's a lot of funding for climate change in COVID-19. So there's all the $1 trillion infrastructure plan, and there's the in Congress, $3.5 trillion reconciliate, reconciliation package, sometimes known as the American Jobs Plan, both in Congress, uh, expecting that something will come out, perhaps, perhaps not with those numbers, but it's going to fund both climate change and COVID-19 at, at significantly higher levels. For climate, people are talking in Congress about Civilian Climate Corps, would be an interesting idea. Uh, this has already been funded, $3 billion from Economic Development Administration, so-called American Rescue Plan, let's build back better, that's their catchphrase. Uh, we've already mentioned the $8 billion for Oper Operation Warp Speed. So the bottom line point here, these urgent, important challenges have gotten our attention. And the, uh, the Congress and philanthropies and the public generally supports putting, let's say, massive resources into solving them. So here's a perspective, what I've said, uh, mega trends impacting climate change and COVID-19, what, what's common about them? Urgent need for innovation in both, don't have the commercial technology yet. Uh, uncertain trajectory, COVID could have another surge. Uh, we were quite surprised by the last surge. Same with climate change, don't quite know where it's gonna go. So it requires a nimble response. 
special emphasis on inequity and international competitiveness. Both things are typical, I would say, very significant in, uh, in both challenges. Funding's going to grow significantly, as we just uh, noted. And university industry cooperation is critical to deliver the innovations to the public. You have to get it out to the public. That's the point of industry and of, of business, of companies. So Jay Caesar, Oxford, AstraZeneca, and NBBL, they're examples of how we can do this. Uh, and uh, in all both cases, startups have played a, uh, a big role. They have plenty of advantages. They're outcome driven. They have a single minded focus. They want to get just one or two things done. They're nimble, very much in tune with the times and have lots of public and let's say governmental support. So interestingly, the experience in dealing with COVID, which is rolling out faster than climate change, suggests how we may deal with climate change. And there are some lessons learned, which I don't think we fully identified and assimilated yet. I'd like to call your attention to this very interesting report came out in June of 2020, Innovation Impact of US Universities. Uh, and here's the URL if you wanna look it up. Some of their recommendations, we may take them to heart or not, prioritize research. These are, of course, recommendations for universities. More research, research spending is likely to mean greater innovation impact. Second recommendation, run an efficient outcomes-focused technology transfer operation. They give examples. In fact, here are some of them. MIT, Stanford, Drexel, and Brigham uh, Young uh, have done exactly this and, and seen really uh, remarkable success. Install, instill a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship throughout the university, very important. And the last point is very important as well, engage closely with surrounding businesses and the innovation community, sometimes nowadays called place-based innovation. And there is a big effort uh, actually in Chicago from EDA, one of the funders we had on a previous slide, uh, issued a call and lots of people in Chicago are, are responding to that. So there's lots, it's very interesting develops and lots to be learned. Uh, and I think we can all look forward to the next uh, year or two with COVID, the next decade or two with climate change to see how it comes out. So thank you very much. Love to take questions if there are any. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, this is Eric Ginsberg from the Polsky Center at the University of Chicago. Are there any specific lessons from the vaccine development that you would apply to energy storage production and to the parallel uh, development with research, for example, placing big bets before the technology is uh, fully proved, or anything else, that, um, specific things that you think would translate from one field to the other? Thank you. Yeah, great question. Thanks for that question. And I think you hit on it. Uh, doing things in parallel really speeds things up. Uh, my sense, and uh, I think others, most others would agree, that the attention given to climate change has grown dramatically, really within the last year, maybe two years. Before that, scientists knew about it. Uh, others weren't aware of it or didn't take it seriously. But uh, you hear in the news every day another extreme weather event, which was made worse by climate change. And that seems to become, be becoming an accepted uh, piece of science. So once that's there, then you can start to think about, oh, we really do have to hurry. And how can we advance the rollout? And I think you hit on it. Uh, the vaccine developers did everything in parallel. You have to go through analogous steps for energy storage. You really want to prove that it works. I mean, the example I gave of the South Australia, at that time, world's biggest energy storage installation looks tiny now, but everybody was waiting to see how it worked. And after a year, we realized, oh, it does work. No, don't seem to be any problems. Then people started to think about developing much bigger ones. And that's a huge delay. So that can be overcome. You need to de-risk it. Companies will not put their future on the line for that, and that's where Philanthropies, I mean, think of the Gates Foundation and others that uh, have the cash to uh, invest that way, but also governments. And, uh, and I think that can really speed things up. Great point. 
Any other questions from the audience here? Any questions from the live stream? Not yet? Uh, a, a bit of a tangential question, George. Um, how does nuclear energy play a role in multi-day discharge of the batteries and energy storage? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and maybe still uh, people are talking about how to resolve it. But to me, the, it, well, first, first point, it's hard to imagine decarbonizing by 2050 without nuclear. It's now about 20% uh, of U.S. electricity, and it's, of course, carbon-free. Take that away, and you're going to make the challenge very much worse. So let's say that we need it. Then the question is, what form do we need it in? And my view, and many others too, feel that the gargantuan reactors, gigawatt scale, that we build now are not the wave of the future. Why? Because each one is a work of art. You don't mass produce those. Each one is its own, you know, its own project. Uh, they're expensive. Uh, the two that were uh, scheduled in, in Georgia, uh, well, 10 years ago, one has been abandoned because it was too expensive and way over, uh, way over budget, way over um, uh, timeline. The second one is struggling. So you really need something else. And there is a bright spot on the future. It's a small modular reactor. Instead of a gigawatt, it might be 100 megawatts. And the micro reactor, instead of being 100 megawatts, might be, I don't know, uh, some number, of maybe one or, or 10 megawatts, small enough to put on the back of a truck. And that means if it's, if it's on the back of a truck, you can take it where you need it. So very quickly respond to things that happen, such as extreme weather events. So uh, this is probably the wave of the future. Can you make it, and you're asking about how, what would it do with multi-day storage? Well, you can make it uh, dispatchable, at least in more than one way, and this way I think is very interesting. You put uh, an electrolyzer plant along with a small modular reactor, and when you don't need the electricity for the grid, you direct it to the electrolyzer. You're making green hydrogen. That green hydrogen will, of course, play a role in decarbonizing the rest of the grid and maybe heavy transportation and steel production and things like that. So effectively, you make it dispatchable. Uh, and that looks like a really attractive uh, opportunity. Why you can mass produce the small mo modular reactor components. You can make one uh, sort of regulatory uh, certification and suddenly open the door to, to, uh, to lots of new reactors. And the price is likely to come down just from the learning curve, because all the components are the same or almost the same. And therefore, you can make lots of them. And that's what drives the price down. So I think that's really an attractive opportunity. Great. Thank you.